Okay, hello everyone. It's a little after 10. Sorry that we're getting started a little bit late. Um, but glad you all are here for Bible class this morning. Hopefully we'll have a few more, maybe trickle in as we get going. Uh, but glad you all are here. Uh, let's begin, of course, first with a word of prayer. I got a, a message from Ruth and Jim Reynolds. They, they will not be able to join us for worship today, but she did want me to pass along a prayer request. Uh, a good friend of theirs who's a fellow resident at Lafayette, his name is John Thomas. Uh, he has a broken shoulder. Uh, and so, so they wanted us to pray for him this morning. And uh, Ms. Joe, she specifically wanted me to say, if you wanted to send him a card, he is in room 533 at Lafayette. So uh, let's keep John Thomas in prayer. Let's keep the Reynolds in prayer since they weren't able to join us uh, today. <clears throat> Are there any other prayer requests or prayers of praise we want to mention? Barbara? I have two. Uh, my cousin, John Robert, um, he's having surgery on his Absolutely. I know we've been dealing with that for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll be praying for that tomorrow. Is that early in the morning that he goes in? Uh, no, first thing in the morning, yeah. 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 Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Um, let's continue to pray for both of them. Sue, I understand, has been feeling quite good lately, uh, which is uh, encouraging. We want to continue to pray for Ron. Um, he is in Cardinal Hill, and he was telling me uh, Friday that he may be released to go home tomorrow, but that wasn't like a definite thing. But we want to pray for him. And we want to pray for Ramona, too. This has obviously been very stressful on her, and she has uh, her own health challenges as well. And it's been, this has been a long journey for Ron. Anyone else? Nathaniel? Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for mentioning that. Any others? Okay. Well, bow with me. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning. <clears throat> we give you thanks for this first day of the week that we can come together. We pray you bless our time in your word. You'll bless our time in worship and in fellowship. We have a number of things planned today. We pray that you're glorified in all of these things, that we're blessed by partaking in them. Father, we uh, want to lift up those we mentioned this morning who need you in different ways. We want to pray for the Reynolds friend, John Thomas, that you will watch over him as he recovers from his broken shoulder, uh, that you will bless him with the pain, you'll bless him as he... Uh, recovers, and we pray that that's as smooth a process as possible. We also want to pray for the Reynolds. Uh, we love them, and we're uh, s sorry that they can't be here this morning. They've had a, a long week and, and uh, have uh, various challenges going on, and they're quite, quite exhausted. We pray that you will uh, bless them uh, today. Father, we also want to lift up uh, Barbara's cousin, John Roberts. We're thankful that he's been released from the hospital, uh, but we pray for these, these heart issues he has going on. We pray for the new, new medication that he's on. We ask that uh, especially the issues related to the, the heart valves that they discovered. Uh, we pray that you will bless him and that uh, you'll, you'll watch over the doctors and nurses who were taking care of him, that you'll restore him to good health. We want to pray for our brother Craig as he goes in for um, the nerve block tomorrow. We ask that that will be successful, that they can get to the bottom of what's causing all this pain, uh, that you'll bless him and Barbara tomorrow and, and uh, in, in the time after that as well. And Lord, we want to continue to lift up our sister Sue, Bless her in her fight with cancer. We're thankful that she's had a number of good days where she's been feeling well. Uh, we pray that you'll bless the chemo treatments. We pray for her and Daryl uh, through this whole journey. 
And we also want to pray for Ron and Ramona on the journey they're on. We pray that uh, you'll bless Ron as he may be able to come home. And Father, you know what's, what's best for his health. Uh, you also know how ready he is to, to be home for a while after being in hospital and rehab for so long. We pray for Ramona uh, as this has been hard on her and she has as well uh, health, health issues and challenges and pain that she deals with every day. Uh, please bless them both. And Lord, we uh, want to lift up also the wildfires in Hawaii. We pray for everyone who's lost homes or businesses, everyone whose lives have been completely upended, and we especially think of those who have lost loved ones. Uh, we pray for the firefighters and others fighting to contain the fire and that, uh, that they will be successful in that uh, soon and that you'll, you'll again bless that entire situation. And Father, there are other things happening all around the world that are so much bigger than us and that um, are in many ways outside our control, but we can lift those things up to you, uh, acknowledge that you are in control, and pray your hand to continue to, to be over those things and that you will continue to be with your people, especially that we will shine as lights uh, in, in all seasons of life and point people to you. Uh, bless us as we study the book of Acts this morning and see how the early church did that very thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, last week uh, we wrapped up a lengthy episode uh, in the life of the early church that Luke records for us in the book of Acts. Uh, this, this whole episode began at the beginning of chapter 3 when Peter healed a crippled man as he's on his way into the temple, and that led to Peter having the opportunity to preach to crowds who gathered to see about this miracle that had happened, uh, and that led to a lot of people converting to the faith, but it also led to Peter and John getting arrested. And uh, they were told by the Jewish uh, council, the Sanhedrin, they were told and threatened by them not to speak in Jesus' name anymore. They just need to cut this out. Uh, and the Jewish council is hoping that will help silence this whole thing. Uh, so we focused last time specifically on the early church's response to those threats in Acts chapter 4. So Peter and John... We read last time they return to their friends, tell them what all has happened, and then what do all of them do as soon as they learn about this? Anyone remember? What's the first thing they all do? They go to God in prayer. That's right. Uh, and anyone remember what they pray for? Do they pray, Lord, please take all this away? Do they, yes, that's right. They make a prayer for boldness. So... They turn to, let me get my clicker on here, they, they turn in prayer to God, realizing God is in complete control of all things, he's sovereign, I'll have more to say about that during our sermon this morning, uh, but they turn to God, recognizing his sovereignty, uh, and as they pray, they see a, a connection, a link between what happened to Jesus when he was arrested, put on trial, condemned to death, what happened to Jesus and what is happening to them now. And they, they realize that the threats, the opposition they're facing, this comes with the territory of following Jesus. This is part of what following Jesus looks like. And so they pray for God to grant them boldness, to continue proclaiming his word. And they ask that God would continue to work in their midst, uh, as he has been doing already. And after they pray, Luke tells us that the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And that's a, a strong sign that God has heard their prayer uh, and then we read that they resume uh, spreading the word of God. They do that with the very boldness that they just prayed for and that they're, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we focused a lot on these things last week. And then we read another summary statement of the life of the early church. This isn't the first one we've read, but we read in this summary statement how the members of the early church were very generous towards one another. Uh, Luke tells us that anyone who owned houses or property uh, they were selling that, they were laying the money at the feet of the apostles, uh, and the, the apostles would then distribute that money uh, in a way that would meet everyone's needs, so everyone's being taken care of. So we see here in the example of the earliest church how they are really uh, looking out for one another and really taking care of one another. And then one specific example uh, at the end of that summary statement is the example of Joseph, who's also known and know much more uh, famously as Barnabas. Barnabas, Luke tells us, sold a plot of land. Uh, he gave the money to the apostles so that the apostles could distribute that. Uh, and we ended by mentioning that Barnabas's name, is a nickname really, that the apostles call him, it means son of encouragement. And Luke tells us that right here. 
And Barnabas making this generous offering is actually only one of several ways that he lives up to that nickname throughout the book of Acts. And so we'll keep seeing that as Acts' uh, narrative goes along. But we, we ended with the, the exhortation, the application that the church can never have enough Barnabases. Uh, you can't have too much of one role or another. That's why we're a body with many members, like Paul talks about. But you can't really have enough sons and daughters of encouragement. So uh, that's something we can all strive to be, like Barnabas is here. So uh, that's what we talked about last time. This morning, we'll start reading about the first internal problem that the early church faces. Uh, we've already read of some external challenges, some opposition they're facing, and that's going to continue to increase. Uh, but now we also read about some problems arising from within the church as well. Uh, and the first challenge that they face is the pretty famous, or you might want to say infamous, uh, episode of Ananias and Sapphira. So this is worth looking at because we can sometimes romanticize the early church a little bit uh, as though they had everything figured out and they, everything they did was just right in line with God's will and everything went great uh, for them. Uh, that's maybe a surface level th thought about the early church, but they actually had a whole lot of problems and a lot of things they had to deal with. And um, even just casually reading through the letters of Paul is, is a great way to see that. I mean, they, they faced a lot of challenges uh, throughout their early years. And this is uh, the first of a few problems that Luke records for us here that the Jerusalem church faces that we'll look at today. So as we move into Acts chapter 5, uh, this is a good place to remind ourselves that the scriptures were not written with the chapter and verse divisions that we now have and like so much because they help us find stuff quickly uh, because the end of Acts 4 actually flows very seamlessly into the beginning of Acts chapter 5. So chapter 4 ends with this example of Barnabas uh, selling his field and offering uh, the proceeds from that to the church. Uh, let me read that and then let's move right into chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 and you'll see how... how Nicely, Luke transitions here very seamlessly. So, here's the end of chapter 4 again. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so Barnabas and Ananias, they contrast with each other. They're kind of like a Venn diagram. They overlap in some ways, but they're also different in some other ways. So they both have property. They both sell that property. They both bring the money to the church. They bring the money specifically to the leaders there. They bring the money to the apostles. But Barnabas brings everything that he made from that purchase. And Ananias and his wife... Uh, they bring only part of it. And Luke makes sure to tell us, because this will be important a few verses from now, that Ananias and his wife, they're both in on this. They both agree on this. And that sets the stage for what's going to happen to them. So let's read what happens to them. Let's start by reading verses 5 through 6. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read? Uh, I'm sorry, it's verses 3 through 6. Uh, Barbara, thank you. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Okay, so things don't end well for Ananias. Uh, they end as bad as they can, right? They end with him dying suddenly. So that's quite shocking. And, and we'll, we will come to discuss why this was so severe. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, this happens, Ananias dies after Peter tells Ananias that he has lied, and he's lied not just to Peter. Uh, he's lied to God. 
And Peter, before he makes that statement, he asks a series of questions here, a series of rhetorical questions to Ananias. So we'll just walk through them. First one says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit uh, by keeping back some of the proceeds of the land? So Peter, as an apostle, we've seen this already abundantly in Acts, um, and if time allows, we'll see it more this morning. He's been empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit has been working through him to perform various miracles and wonders. Well, here is the Holy Spirit again, uh, having empowered Peter. It's giving him insight into the situation uh, and allowing him to see the truth behind uh, what Ananias is doing and what Ananias is saying. And notice uh, there's a contrast here between what's happening with Ananias and what we've read has been happening with the early church ever since Acts chapter 2. So the early church has been filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts, beginning right there on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we just read uh, at, the, at the end of that whole episode where Peter gets arrested and there's threats made, the church prays for boldness. Luke tells us they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, while the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, Ananias has been filled with Satan. Ananias, Satan has filled his heart. Uh, so this, I think, gives us a clue about why Ananias dies from this, why this is such a drastic thing that happens. And we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but it seems like this is an early attempt by Satan to infiltrate the church. Uh, and he's doing that through, through Ananias and through Ananias' life. So that might, might give us a clue as to why this is so serious, why this is dealt with so severely. But that's the first rhetorical question. And then Peter says, look, while it remained unsold, wasn't it yours? It belonged to you. So this touches on something, Mary, I remember you said this last week, uh, and that is that Ananias was not obligated to sell his property and donate it, and, and neither was Barnabas. This was something that was meant to be done willingly, voluntarily. Paul will talk about in the Corinthian letters how God loves a cheerful giver. Um, this is not something meant to be done out of compulsion. And then, moving on to our next rhetorical question, Peter says, even after it was sold, even after you, you sold it, um, Ananias, weren't you free to do with the money as you, as you willed, as you wanted to do with it? Uh, was, was there any reason to lie uh, as though these funds, <clears throat> uh, as, though, as though you were presenting, like, as, as though this was the full amount you were presenting when it was actually only part uh, of what you earn from the sale. Um, was there any good reason for that? And certainly there is no good reason for that. We can think of reasons why Ananias and Sapphira perhaps did this. Um, maybe they were trying to boost their reputation, boost their honor. Uh, Barnabas probably gained quite a bit of honor within the eyes of the early church for that selfless offering. Maybe they were trying to do the same thing without, without actually, actually doing it. They were trying to just look like they were doing that. But, of course, that's not a good reason to do this. That, that's a reason that runs completely contrary to uh, the teachings of Jesus. Because Jesus, we read it all throughout the Gospel of Luke, he emphasizes doing good without seeking glory, without seeking recognition. Um, so, and then that leads to Peter's last question here. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Uh, and then after that, Peter again declares what we already mentioned uh, he says, you not only lied to men, you've lied to God. Earlier he said you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe that's a good way of thinking about a little connection about the Holy Spirit being fully God. He says you've lied to God. And then Ananias uh, falls down and dies. Uh, some young men from the church uh, take him away and bury him. And Luke tells us that great fear falls upon everyone who heard about this, uh, which would mean, I'm sure, the entire church and perhaps people beyond the church as well. Everyone hears about this and they're quite shaken up. So, as though that wasn't enough, this whole thing basically happens again with Ananias' wife. The whole thing happens again with Sapphira. Uh, and the deception element of what they've done here uh, is even more clear in this case with Sapphira. So, let's read now verses 7 through 11. Uh, would anyone be willing to read this passage for us? Verses 7 through 11. Any takers? Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. After an interview of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. 
And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. All right. So uh, we read here that Sapphira meets with the apostles later that same day, not knowing what has happened to her husband, not knowing what's happened to Ananias. And what proceeds to happen here is a bit like Luke's not old enough for me to have to do this yet one day perhaps I'll have to but a bit like the classic approach that parents sometimes take with their children when they know their children have, have done something wrong but the children don't know the parents know uh, and so the parents are asking to see if the children or the child will be honest uh, it's kind of like that here Peter asks all right did you sell the land for x amount uh, the amount that Ananias and Sapphira claimed they sold it for. And S Sapphira could have been honest and say, actually, uh, it was for less than that. But instead, she continues on with this lie. She says, yes, we did sell it for that amount. Well, then Peter goes on to ask another rhetorical question here. And his question helps us see, again, the, the seriousness and the nature of the offense here that Ananias and Sapphira are committing says they are testing the spirit of the Lord. Uh, they are, and that's, in the law of Moses, I mean, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. They are testing the spirit of the Lord. Um, Jesus was tempted to do that in the wilderness, and he quoted that same passage. And Peter says, all right, you're not just, again, you're not just lying to Peter. You're lying to the spirit, intending to get away with it. So they're, they're trying to pull one over on God, basically. In that, in that sense, they're trying to put God to the test and Peter, quite ominously here, he says that the same thing that happened to Ananias is about to happen to Sapphira. The men who just buried Ananias are back. They're at the door, um, <clears throat> ready to bury her as well. And sure enough, uh, she dies. The young men bury her. And once again, we read great fear came upon uh, not only the whole church, but everyone outside the church as well who heard about this um, as, uh, that great fear, fear fell upon everyone who heard about it. All right, so this is a pretty sobering, pretty startling, maybe a little bit unnerving uh, passage in Acts. And it's a little bit sudden to even read it because everything we've read so far about the church has been so positive up to this point. We've, we've been reading about miracles. We've been reading about preaching. Uh, we've been reading about conversions. And we've also read about some opposition, but the church has been boldly following Jesus as a united front, even in the face of that opposition. But then all of a sudden, in the midst of all these positive, wonderful things, we read of something negative happens that ends with two people dying. And that's obviously a very severe um, consequence of their, of their actions. That's the most severe consequence there is. So... I want to just open this up to us to think about for a moment. Mary, you're already ready to go. Uh, but why do you think this happened? And why do you think it, it ended with people dying? Well, Mary. What I was going to mention, though, is how easily and how quickly Satan can come into, you know, everything was going well until yeah. up until this point. Yeah. And see how quickly Satan came in. And undoubtedly, these people were nice people. You know, they were selling their property. They were going to help out. And Satan said, hey, let me... <coughs> Let you lie a little bit. Let you keep a little of that back, you know. Mm. So it, it's easy to have a thing can take over you, you know, when you don't really mean to. I'm, I'm sure they didn't wake up and say, we're going to sell this land and we're going to lie about it. But Satan came along and this mm. is what happened. I appreciate you saying how, how easily um, when things are going so well that Satan can get to work. This is a great example. Even the most, like, spiritually abundant church, Satan will try to infiltrate and he can you know, he, he can be successful at that. With Ananias and Sapphira, when you were talking, it made me think about Judas. Um, Judas, we read in, I believe it's John's gospel account, that before he betrayed Jesus, he had already kind of been holding back some money himself from the uh, treasury and things of that nature. So it seems as though 
Satan had been kind of slowly working on his heart for some time, and then it culminates in, boom, betraying Jesus. We don't know anything about Ananias and Sapphira outside of this, but it would make sense if perhaps throughout their, their life, Satan had been kind of slowly gaining some footholds, and then, boom, they try to lie to the Holy Spirit. Um, anyway, just a thought. Bob? Yes, I'd like to add to that. It seems as though that when we try to do good, Satan's always present. Paul talks about that to the Romans, saying that uh, evil, evil is always present. Mm -hmm. We try our best to be good, but Satan just fills our heart and takes over. It seems as though that sometimes we want what we don't need, or we want what we can't get. But Satan's always present. Yeah. And Satan can, under the influence of temptation and giving into temptation, we can think so... We can, get, we can get tunnel vision, and we can sometimes don't realize how unclearly we're thinking. And Peter reveals that here. He's like, look, you didn't have to sell this, and you could have been honest about how much you're giving to us. You know, it was yours to do with what you want. Why have you done this? And in their minds, I'm sure they have very good reasons for why they were trying to pull one over on the Holy Spirit. Uh, but they got that tunnel vision thanks to the deception of Satan. Um, they weren't thinking clearly. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, one more thing. Uh, Satan has, I said this in my lesson the other Sunday, he has strategized mm -hmm. a plan for each one of us. Yeah. Specifically for us. Yeah, he knows our weaknesses. Go ahead, Barbara. I think it shows a clear contrast between the old law and the new law of Christ where they had a specific amount they were supposed to tithe and sometimes a tenth of their wages or sometimes even a third, depending on the purpose of the tithe. And here it's abundantly clear that it isn't the amount, but at the heart that gives it, yeah. that is, that he, the point is being driven here. Mm -hmm. And that when our heart is um, uh, being deceptive for whatever purposes, most probably, uh, pride and vanity, uh, it's not acceptable to God. And I think he, he just made this huge message, mm -hmm. you know, to, to pound that home to us, yeah. that our service to God is what we purpose in our heart. And whatever amount we can give, you know, with cheerfully, and whether it's through service or contributions, financial contributions. It's what's in our heart that is important to him. And he's not going to tolerate the deception mm -hmm. of being a better giver or anything like that. It's, it's the way we, you know, the reason that we yeah. give that's more important. Yeah. Reminds me of Jesus' teaching about don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, you know. Any other thoughts? Well, again, I know it's kind of an unsettling passage, and it's meant to be. Like, it's okay if we feel unsettling. We don't have to just be like, oh, yeah, there's no, no difficulty. I can read this and feel totally fine. It's, it's okay if this is unsettling. Uh, I think it's supposed to be. But um, this also reminded me of a couple, couple of similar moments from the Old Testament. And, and Luke, perhaps, you know, he's writing people who know their Bible very well. And so perhaps he wants us to, to have some of these moments kind of be echoing in our mind as we read Ananias and Sapphira. Um, made me think about a person from the book of Joshua named Achan. Anybody remember Achan and what happened to Achan? Bob remembers, Chris nodding his head. So Achan, um, he kept back, as Israel's conquering the promised land, he kept back some spoils of war when God specifically said, don't do that. Um, and the Lord tells Joshua, the Israelites start like losing in battle because of this. The Lord tells Joshua, this sin has, must be dealt with, uh, or Israel is not going to have success against its enemies. Uh, this is a, maybe a little bit like that. I'll get to you in, in just a second, Norman, and also you, O'Brien. Uh, also made me think of another character, uh, not exactly the same moment, but a little similar, Uzzah. Anybody remember the character Uzzah? Comes from the life of, of David. As David is transporting the ark to Jerusalem... David, this is something we have not talked about in our summer series because there's just too much going on in David's life to cover it uh, throughout the summer. But he went about trying to transport it in a way that did not align with the scriptures, did not align with the law. There's, the law has specific instructions for how to transport the ark. 
David is not following them. Uzzah is not following them. Uh, Uzzah's family is not following. So they're all in on this. And Uzzah, as they're transporting, he reached out to try to keep the ark from falling to the ground. And he struck dead. Uh, because you're not supposed to touch the ark. And if you've been transporting it the way it's supposed to be transported, you wouldn't have had to touch the ark. Um, so there is this idea, and I realize these things are jarring. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to make light of them. But there is this idea in Scripture that there is a holiness to God's people and there's a holiness to God's presence among his people. Think about the ark. It's God's presence among the Israelites. The Holy Spirit is present among the early church. It's this idea of there's a holiness to that, and that holiness can be dangerous and even be deadly to play with. Uh, a great analogy that I've heard, maybe you've heard it before too, to appreciate this, holiness is a little bit like electricity. Electricity is such a blessing. I mean, think about all the ways we're benefiting from electricity just in this moment right now. Uh, but if we aren't careful and we aren't responsible, you can get electrocuted. Right? This is kind of the way holiness works. Um, but anyways, let me pause here because there are a couple other hands up. Uh, I don't know who has the microphone right now. Uh, go ahead, Norma. I was just going to uh, share, too, with examples that... Um, with this example, their lives were taken. And then as you were talking about other examples, with King Saul, he was not obedient. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, his kingdom was given to King David. And um, it says in the Bible, in God's word, that obedience is greater than sacrifice. Yeah. And so with King Saul, he... Uh, was removed from kingship and from the grace and honor of the Lord. And we have to remember that that is also true for any believer, that obedience is greater than sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. Nathaniel, you know a thing about that? that, that you... I was actually going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Nathaniel, Nathaniel, if you weren't there, he... he taught on David and Saul as part of the summer series, and that was a major part of his lesson. Yeah. O'Brien, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, dude, um, I feel like also it was kind of a deterrent since this is when the church was just forming and starting. It was kind of a sign from God to say, hey, like to try, to try to nip it in the bud of all the sin that could be coming in. Like, hey, yeah. you didn't listen. This is, you know, this is what's going to happen where, you know, because it said, you know, everyone was, was afraid and scared when they seen it yeah. happen. So I feel like it was kind of a sign from God as the church is just starting out and growing, just trying to deter any sins and evil things kind of stepping in at yeah. that yeah. early stage of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was actually the very next thing I was going to say. Uh, you know, you read the rest of the New Testament. And again, I keep thinking of the letters of Paul because he encountered so many challenges. Uh, but... It's not like this is the way sin is dealt with every single time. Uh, there are times when Paul is writing about things going on in a given church, and there can be like a whole drawn-out process of dealing with it, and there's personalities and emotions and clashing, and Paul's at, from a distance trying to deal with it all through letters. I mean, it, it's not like every single time something wrong happens, somebody ends up dying. So why does it happen here? And, and I think you made a, a great point. You know, it, the church is very young. It's in its earliest days. And these are the apostles we're dealing with. I mean, they have great authority in the church. The reason we regard the New Testament as inspired scripture largely has to do with the fact that the apostles are writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as are others who, who have, are closely associated with the apostles. Uh, so they have great authority. And if this early on, someone can not only pull one over on God, but pull one over on the apostles, uh, that could undermine their credibility and undermine their authority. Uh, and so perhaps God acts so decisively here um, to demonstrate to the church that Jesus' apostles, an apostle basically means representative or messenger. These are Jesus' representatives. Uh, they truly have, it's not a joke, they truly have authority from God that needs to be respected. And like you were saying, O'Brien, if that had not been respected at this early stage, uh, perhaps that would have created all kinds of problems down the road. Uh, that would have been even worse than the problems the church ended up actually having to, to deal with. Uh, Nathaniel. I'll kind of expand on what Norma was saying, just that um, what I've noticed in, in several of these instances that we've been talking about is that they do it with such pride. 
And if I go back to, um, to 1 Samuel, you know, with the Saul story, um, he was trying to explain to Samuel that, um, you know, that the soldiers took the spoils of war. I, I killed the Amalekites, but the soldiers, it was their fault. Mm. You should blame them. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then Judas, you know, we see him um, very pridefully handing Jesus over to the, uh, to the authorities. And it, it's almost like you can read the text and, and see a smile on his face. Mm. And in the same instance with this one, you know, when she's like, when he asks, you know, tell me, did you get the land for so much? Yeah, yeah, I did. You know, it's almost like you can hear how prideful they are of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And pride is, I mean... It's such a, it's at the root of so much sin in the world, you know, and I, I think a good case can be made it's at the root of even the initial sin in the garden, you know, the desire to be like God. What is that but pride? Yeah, has a huge influence. Uh, Jason, yeah. Bro. <laughs> uh, there's kind of another element here that I see that I was, I was talking recently with someone about, um, this idea of free will and predestination, right? And the way that this question comes initially is, you know, is, I mean, the way it's worded here, when you read it, it says, why has Satan, right? As if Satan had this, um, uh, you know, as if Satan may have been in control, right? You could yeah. read that question in that manner. And that's yeah. obviously not what happened. Um, and then I think, then, then you have the choice that's made and, and the consequences of that, that choice. Uh, and the examples you used um, are all very similar, right, where people have deceived. They, they were not obedient, as was said. Um, and it is, a, it is a free will. It's a free choice. We have to be obedient. Yeah. And, you know, just thinking about the language here, um, you know, to not be confusing, right? That, that, you know, I don't believe there was any, um, it, it was not that Satan had this grasp, you know, physically like, have entered Ananias and Sapphira. Like mind control. Right. Yeah. But they made the choice. They allowed that to happen uh, in the same manner uh, as the others that you mentioned. Yeah. Right? And to go all the way back to, you know, the Pharaoh and the, and the plagues and God hardening uh, Pharaoh's heart, right? You can read that and, and, and maybe think that the Pharaoh didn't have a choice, but he did. He had choice. He had free will, just as Ananias and Sapphira did. Yeah. Um, and no more, no more was that some divine intervention type thing in that situation than it is here with Satan, you know, entering yeah. or filling the heart of Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. And that same kind of language is used in the first volume of what Luke wrote in Luke talking about Judas. It says Satan entered his heart, but Judas still bore responsibility for what he did, right? right. It was still, it, it was it was like a partnership between Judas and Satan, and that's the same thing going on here uh, with Ananias and Sapphira and Satan, yeah. All right, well, great discussion. Uh, we will move on and just keep moving until, until the bell rings, but now that Luke has told us about this um, event, this internal problem that the church deals with, uh, really Peter, with the Holy Spirit guiding him, deals with very decisively, uh, we move on to <clears throat> another summary statement of the church's daily life. This is the third one we've come across now uh, in Acts. Uh, and again, just as a reminder, this is how in these earlier chapters of Acts, this is how Luke advances his narrative of the early church. We get event, summary statement, event, Summary statement. So these are like little bridges connecting one event to the next. So let's read this summary here. Uh, could I get a volunteer to read verses 12 through 16? I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's uh, portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. 
People also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right. So we see here, as we move beyond Ananias and Sapphira, uh, we see how God is continuing to work powerfully, even work miraculously uh, through Jesus' apostles. Uh, we see the church is continuing to meet in uh, the temple, the Jerusalem temple, and a portion of it called Solomon's Portico, or your translation might say Solomon's Porch. Uh, if we remember, Solomon is the one who built uh, the first uh, temple there in Jerusalem, so that, that name is appropriate. Uh, but we see in verse uh, 13 that the church at this stage still has a very good reputation among the people. Uh, the, the Jewish people, even those who have not been persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, uh, they're very impressed with what they see the early church doing. They respect them for it. Uh, they, they, perhaps they realize God is, something is happening, and God is, is working on it. They may not have put all the pieces together and come to full faith themselves, but something is happening. Um, but we also read here that people are really hesitant to join them at this point. They're hesitant to join them. So this could have something to do with the threats that the church received from the the Jewish leadership, if word of those threats have spread, then naturally that would make people a little bit nervous to, to jump on board. Um, in the context also of just having read Ananias and Sapphira, uh, this could also be the case that maybe folks don't dare join them because they know there's no faking it with the early church. You know, Ananias and Sapphira tried to fake it and didn't, didn't end well, right? So maybe that's also great fear has fallen upon everybody who's heard about this. Maybe that's also part of what's going on. And yet we read um, that even though people are hesitant to join them, and, and maybe to, to make sense of 13 and 14 together, maybe this means people didn't dare join them while they're gathered in the temple altogether. But we also read at the same time that uh, more than ever now, the church is growing with more and more people being added to the Lord. And Luke gives us a really great visualization of what all this growth, what all this miraculous activity uh, looks like, and it must have been just a really amazing thing uh, to be a part of. But we read here that, that people are carrying out uh, those in their families who are sick and those who are afflicted with various uh, things. They're, they're carrying them out into the streets. We also read that people from outside Jerusalem are flocking into the city, uh, also with their sick loved ones, uh, and with hopes of them being healed as well. <clears throat> And we read about just how powerfully uh, the Holy Spirit is working through uh, Peter. Uh, so that even Peter's shadow has power here. Uh, Peter can just walk by, and if his shadow falls on someone, that person can be healed. Uh, so that's, that's really just uh, remarkable. This might remind us of some things that might sound a little familiar from Jesus' ministry. So... Again, Luke and Acts, both written by the same person, very well-connected narratives. So going back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we read about a time where people, people were flocking to him to be healed uh, and, and to have demons cast out of them. And Luke tells us Jesus spent all night doing that. Uh, and then also, regarding Peter's shadow, you know, just his shadow falls and people are healed. That might sound a, at least a little bit like... Um, the woman who was continually bleeding, and she, her faith was such that she was like, you know, if I can just touch the, the hem of his garment, you know, that will be uh, sufficient. And so in both cases, Peter's shadow and Jesus' garment, just the least amount of interaction with someone who's full of the Holy Spirit uh, can heal when that's coupled with, with faith. And then also later on in the book of Acts, moving forward to Paul's ministry, uh, we'll see the Holy Spirit work just as powerfully through Paul in a similar way. There, instead of it being a shadow, it's actually like his handkerchief. Um, it, people are like taking it and like running off to people who are sick uh, because there's power there and it, they can be healed. So we see God is working very powerfully through uh, the apostles. And we also, again, see here that the early church has a good reputation. It's growing at this rapid rate on a very large scale. It's making a big splash. So... We just had this, this bump in the road with Ananias and Sapphira, but overall, I mean, things are just sounding great for the early church. And the second bell is going to ring in a minute, so let me try to sneak this point in before it does. Things are sounding great for the early church. 
But let's remember, and that they recognized this in Acts 4 when they were praying, the early church is following in Jesus' steps. And Jesus also went through a phase in his ministry where he was extraordinarily popular uh, among the common people. We actually read when he's in Jerusalem, uh, this is from Luke 22, uh, the religious leaders wanted to get Jesus, but they didn't know how to do it because they feared the people. If they feared if they took public action in broad daylight against Jesus, there'd be riots and stuff. So that's why they had to work secretly at night through Judas. So Jesus went through a phase, kind of like what the early church is going through, where they're so popular. Uh, but in the same way with Jesus, the church's popularity in Acts, we'll read this really beginning next week, but it will keep on going in future chapters. Uh, the church's popularity is not going to be permanent. Uh, it, it is temporary. But Jesus, and this is a point I really want us to, to think about as we head out here, Jesus was faithful when he had all that popularity and when he lost it all, even faithful all the way to the cross when he was rejected by everybody. Uh, and the early church, we're going to see, as we keep reading, they're going to be faithful as well. Uh, and that, that will lead to the gospel spreading um, in the face of even great opposition, uh, even in the face of some people giving up their life. And that will lead to more people responding to the gospel and sharing an eternal life. But the church, early church is faithful in good times and bad, in season and out of season. And so application for us, each one of us and collectively, uh, we, the church, need to be faithful in all seasons of life. When we're popular, unpopular, uh, when there's prosperity, when there's loss, we need to be faithful. The Lord will be with us through all of that. That's the key. Uh, and so on that note, that was the second bell. So let's go ahead and dismiss. We'll have worship in a few moments.